All right. Well, hey, I, uh, I don't want to take much longer, um, but we have some guests here today who are going to be uh, sharing with us, um, and they, uh, they're my parents. Uh, so, you know, I have so much information I could share with you. Um, but my parents, uh, my parents, I grew up in a pa- pastor's home. They were um, senior pastors for 30-some years, and uh, uh, later on in their ministry, after uh, my older brother and I were out of the house, um, God called my mom and dad to the mission field, and uh, they have been, for nearly 10 years, they've been in Trinidad and Tobago, the southernmost island in the, the Caribbean, and uh, they, the God is using them in mighty ways. They're, they're making an incredible impact with those people. They are highly favored on that island with a lot of respect and influence, and they bring with us, uh, they bring with them some, um, some really important insights for, for us. They bring a worldview that's probably different than our worldview. And, uh, and a passion for the harvest for people who don't know Jesus. And, uh, you know, it's easy sometimes to, to lose sight of uh, how lost the world is. And, and uh, they wear that, those, those glasses, that lens, all the time, seeing people that don't know Jesus. And God's used them to bring a lot of people to the Lord. And so I'm excited to have them come share, maybe stir us up today, um, get us excited. At the end of the service, we're going to take up a special offering. And there's no obligation, but if you, uh, you know, wanna, don't want to spring that on you, uh, but we want to help support them. 100% of their, uh, uh, their income is raised uh, so, so that they can do the work of the Lord on the mission field. Uh, as they get ready to come, uh, why don't you check out this video, and they're going to they're gonna share with us this morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. Let's try that once more. Good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, that's much better. You know what I like is I know that there's people all over town in church just like we are right now. But the way we think is around the world, every hour today, there's people who are gathering in cathedrals, in storefronts. Some of them are gathering in houses. They're gathering under trees. But they're doing the same thing that we're doing. In fact, the truth is, every day of the week this is happening. The truth is that when the end of the first century completed, the end of the New Testament It's estimated that one out of every 360 people on the planet identified with the name of Jesus. But today, one out of every three people on the planet identify with the name of Jesus, and one out of seven believe just like we do. That's amazing. A lot of people. You you know, you're awfully quiet. That's, That's good news. That's really good news. So let me just tell you a little about this. In Africa, it used to be that 3% we're Christian. Today, south of the Sahara, 60% are believers. You hear about Iran in the news, but in Iran, what you don't hear is that people are flocking to Jesus. A report I read this year indicated that this man believes the day will come when Iran will be majority Christian. In Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, It is now over 25% Christian, and the Muslims are concerned. I have a video that they put out. They're concerned because they believe the day will come that it will cease to be majority um, Muslim. Just, Just a little more. China today has the same number of evangelical believers as the U.S., between 80 and 100 million evangelical believers we are part of something big that the world has never seen. Amen. Amen. Well, I would like to greet your pastors and say that you have some pretty amazing pastors. <laughs> and we could tell some stories too. But can I just say that sometimes we need people to understand that today, this version of ourselves is the one that God has worked over and worked through. And sometimes, don't you feel like people are still thinking about 20 years ago or 10 years ago? That's not me anymore. It's not Pastor Mike or Pastor Jordan or his wonderful wife, Lindsay. So we are honored to be here. It is uh, not something we take lightly. I also want to greet the people in the room that have been to Trinidad. There's a few of you, yes? <laughs> And have, we have lived life together and done ministry side by side, and ha, it has been a, a pleasure and a privilege. So who watched the royal wedding yesterday? 
Okay, my family kind of knows this about I, me. I, I don't see any of the men saying they got up at four in the morning. I didn't get up at three in the morning to watch it, but I did watch it. Um, these things fascinate me. And as I watched it and the whole idea of royalty and, and uh, you know, the queen and, and all of these people and all the protocol and all of the things that went along with putting this, that day together, uh, it reminded me that I am also a daughter of the king. And I want us to understand that we are royalty. And there's a scripture in, that Mike and I absolutely love in Revelation 7 that gives us a glimpse, it gives us a picture of what it's going to look like when we are all in heaven together. And we are gathered around the throne. And, and, and it says it's such a vast number, you can't count it. It is, doesn't just say it's a multitude, though. It doesn't just stop with it being a, a lot of people around the throne. But it goes on to talk about every nation and every tongue and every tribe and every language is gathered around the throne. And what gets us excited as we travel, not just in Trinidad, but some other countries we've been to, is that God doesn't just see a bunch of people any more than he would in this room. But he sees culture. He sees every nation, tongue, and tribe. He breaks it down for us. He has a heart for the world. And what we love to do is give people that perspective, God's heart for the world. And that's what we do in Trinidad. Yes. All right. We've been in Trinidad for eight years. Really what we do is we train missionaries. We train people to have a heart for the world and a heart for the lost. We're actually training Trinidadians now. We've trained 240 Trinidadians. I think one of the things we like... Uh, at least probably most of the time we like. We've had 232 people in our home, live in our home. We've hosted them from 13 nations. And it's pretty amazing. In fact, uh, Pam will talk about times we're sitting around the table with Google Translate because people are speaking different only, languages. Only way we can talk. So it's, it's pretty amazing. But God has opened up opportunities for us, and we have, uh, he's given us favor. We're not evangelists, but we've seen almost 1,800 people accept Jesus in eight years. Last year alone it was over 200. And, uh, and so what we have begun to do is to see the world the way God sees it. And as we see the world the way God sees it, suddenly we see there's opportunities everywhere. Amen. Yep. You want to tell them anything about what we do? Well, there's three main things that we do for people in North America. And we've had you here. Some of you have come for our Taste and See, which is a month long. It's $1,000, one month, and one plane ticket. And we do a lot of hands-on ministry. We also have missions teams. We had one from this church in February. And then we also train missionaries, and that is every mid-September to mid-December. And that is more academic. Uh, there's still a lot of hands-on ministry, but we also take them through a missions course and, and read some books together uh, and learn what it means to live in another culture and how to function well in another culture that's not your own. Very good. I want to talk to you from John... Yeah. I want to talk to you from John, the fourth chapter. I'll read some scripture in a minute, but I want to tell you a little bit of the story because it's a long story. It takes most of the chapter. And then right at the end, I want to share with you three things, tell you some stories from Trinidad. But in John, the fourth chapter, we find that Jesus and his disciples had, were in a hurry to get north. We know that because it says in this chapter that they had to go through Samaria. This is one of those areas that the Jews never went through. They would always go around if they could avoid it. And I don't know about Des Moines how you are, but in almost every major city in the world, there's areas that you just don't go through unless you make a choice. Now, in New York City, we were just there, and uh, so we're following GPS. GPS doesn't know all of those areas. <laughs> And so we had people tell, ask us how we got where we were going, and they say, oh, you went through a high crime area. But GPS didn't know that. But this was one of those areas that people avoided. And they avoided it for many reasons. It really goes back to even to King David's grandson. From that time on, these people really worshipped differently and didn't associate with the Jewish people and vice versa. And things got even worse Inter, intermarrying and things. And so now they come to this place. There's really no relationship between Samaritans and Jews. But Jesus and his disciples, in a hurry, they're going through. And as they go through, it's about noon and they get tired, so they stop. They stop at this place. The disciples go into town to get some food. I don't know what they were getting, but they were getting some food. If it was in Trinidad, they would have maybe gone to a street vendor. They might have gotten doubles or roti, or maybe they would have gone to KFC. Trinidadians say they have the best KFC in the world. 
But Jesus sat by the well, and as he was by the well, he was tired. And this woman is there, a Samaritan woman, and he asks her for a drink. Now, the Samaritan woman seems to identify that this is a cross-cultural experience, and it doesn't seem to fit what is typical, because she says to him, I'll put my own emphasis on this, are you serious? You're a man, I'm a woman. You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, and you're asking me for a drink? She goes on and says, you don't even have anything to draw from. In other words, she's saying, are you serious? You're going to put your lips on my cup? Everything about this didn't fit the cultural norms. But in this opportunity, Jesus begins to talk to this lady about God, about spiritual things. She didn't understand at first, but suddenly things began to shift. And as things began to shift, her heart started to open up. And I'd like to read these scriptures for you in John, the fourth chapter. You can put the first scripture up now. Then Jesus, then, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Stop right there. The disciples come out of the town and they see Jesus talking to this woman and it says they're surprised or they wondered, but really the idea behind it is they're scandalized by the situation. What is going on here? You're talking to a woman? This is a Samaritan woman. We don't do that. But no one wanted to ask Jesus, what are you doing? I can understand that. But then the lady leaves and goes into town because Jesus had asked her to go get her husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the guy you're living with, you're not married to. You're shacking up with a guy. And she said, you must be a prophet. <laughs> How'd you know all of that? She goes into town and now she says, come see the man that told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? She understood that the people in this town, they were still looking for something. Everybody around the world is looking for something. They're looking for something. And what we have is called the gospel. It's good news. But what is good news for those people in this city? She said, I know what's good news. She is an unlikely evangelist. She goes in. She is the woman that the mothers would say, stay away from that woman. That she's got that reputation. And yet she goes in and she speaks to the town. Probably no one else could have done this. She speaks to the town and the whole town comes out. And the end result in this story is most of the town responds to God that day. So now we come to the next verse. Go to the next verse that we have. Do not say four months more and then the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields and the right for harvest. There's a couple things that really surprised me about this story as I read it. First of all was the fact that these disciples had gone into town to get food. They went to the grocery or they went to the market or they went somewhere. And the very same people that just a few hours later were going to give their life to God, that were going to respond to God, they were in those stores, in those markets. But they did not come back to Jesus and say, you know, Jesus, I think something's going on in this place. Instead of hurrying on, I think we ought to stay here. They're, they're, these people are about to respond to God. There's something stirring here. They didn't say that. When they come back, this woman at the well, she has just opened her heart to God, a spiritual breakthrough in her life, and the disciples don't even see that. What they see is a scandal. You're talking to a Samaritan woman. And the question really came to me, why did the disciples miss a harvest that was right in front of them? And the real question I asked myself was, is it possible that I missed a harvest all around me? Why did they miss the harvest? Isn't it possible that God is working on hearts everywhere I go and I don't see it? And I want to have eyes to see the harvest. If you go to the next slide... There are three things. The first is we have to understand that there's no unreachable people. 
no unreachable places. When we look at unreachable places, they're unreachable for many different reasons. Sometimes they're unreachable because the people are different than us. Sometimes they're unreachable because we don't like an area. Sometimes they're just unreachable because we don't see a possibility of how we could reach them. One of the places we work is with a church that's in an area that's 95% Hindu. And in this area, they used to believe that these Hindus were hard. None of them will come to church. They're not interested in God. And there's nothing that we can do. When God began to make a shift in them, the first thing they said is, there's no unreachable people. And when they began to say that, they looked at the people in their community differently. Today, they have been inside of every home in their community, every Hindu home. They have prayed with every single family. But everything they do as a church now is with eyes to see the harvest all around them. They do a Christmas fair. We were there for their first one. But we were also there. This is a church of 60 or 70 people. We were also there when they had a Christmas fair, which had 1,500 people show up, mainly Hindus. It lasts for five hours. They have three to 400 children show up now. Pam reads the Christmas story to the children. Every child gets a toy. Every child gets a snack bag. Every child gets a meal. All of the adults that show up get a full meal for free. We give out 100 uh, food boxes. In Trinidad, we call them hampers. Every, we, we have a drawing. In fact, a, a politician shows up now, and the politician and I are drawing numbers and giving out these, uh, these uh, hampers, these food boxes. We're calling out the number, and they're coming down, and people are saying, what about my number, you know? So they're given free food, free meals. They're given food boxes, free entertainment. They hear about Jesus. 1,500 showed up. I, we were there the day when they planned on feeding 700, but 1,000 showed up. And I said to them, how did you feed 1,000 people? And they said, well, we pray over the food before we begin, and it never runs out. <laughs> they decided that the next village over is 100% Hindu, and they wanted to try to reach some of the children there's no Christian home, so how can they take a Sunday school or VBS into that area? They found a Hindu home that was willing, and they have Sunday school and VBS in a Hindu home in a community that has no Christians Amen. because they have eyes to see, and they believe there's no unreachable places. In fact, the four ladies from your church that came, they were with us in this same area. No adults have responded to Jesus. We did an open-air service at night, and the first man in this community stood to his feet and gave his life to Jesus. It was powerful. The second thing is there's no unreachable people. Sometimes we look at people, and for a variety of reasons, we believe people are unreachable. There, uh, and we have to change this thinking because there's no one that can't be reached. Sometimes we believe people are hard. The most unreachable person in the New Testament was Saul. Saul was this guy, he was after the Christians. The Christians believed this guy was unreachable. There's no record that anyone shared Jesus with Saul. Even after he became a Christian, the church was still afraid of him. He was unreachable. But in that story we found that here's this guy that's unreachable, but God was working on his heart. That's inconsistent with the way I used to think. This is the guy that is unreachable, but he is the very one that God is working on his heart. That's what the story tells us in Acts. And so we have to begin looking at people differently because when we see them from God's eyes, we realize there's nobody that's unreachable. We may not know how, but we begin to ask God, how do you want to reach that person? There is a Muslim grocery store that we've gone to for five years, six years, and it has a parking lot that is at an angle like this. And so they have someone who runs the, the parking lot to help you park. And I, I have never talked to this man. His, man's, his name's Lochin. I've never talked to him. But every time he would see me, he would wave at me. I drive by, he waves at me. But this particular day, he comes to my car as I'm leaving, and I roll down the window, and he said to me, I just got out of the hospital. I have an abscess on my foot, and I need antibiotics, but I have no money. I knew he was asking for money, 
But I said to him, you know, if God heals your foot, then you don't need antibiotics. He thought about it for a minute, said, I never thought of that. And quickly he says, my wife's a Christian, but I'm not. I, I don't know what his background was, but he wanted to make that really clear. I said, that's okay. I'll just pray that God will heal your foot. Two days later, the bandages are off of his foot. Two more days, he's in a shoe walking around. Three or four more days, I'm in the store. He comes in, and he's running up to us. This is just before Thanksgiving in November. He's running up to us, and he's saying, I'm healed, I'm healed. He says, Jesus healed me, and I'm praying every day. Somebody who looked like they were unreachable. But God has a strategy, strategy to reach everyone. You can take a look at ISIS members who've turned to Jesus. You can look at any situation. God is reaching hearts, and we just have to have eyes to see it. And finally, there's a harvest you can see. You see, we live our lives in such a way, it's like we have blinders on. And here this man doesn't see the shark that's swimming right next to him. And many times, there's a harvest right next to us, and we don't see it. God wants to open our eyes, just like the disciples missed the harvest that was right in front of them. They didn't see it. And I believe God wants to do that with us. We were in Guyana. We uh, pastored a church in Guyana for South America for four months. They didn't, the missionary had left. They needed someone. We were there, made about seven trips. Guyana is very hot, very hot, very humid. Uh, if there is no sea breeze, it's, it's almost unbearable, huge mosquitoes. The church didn't have air conditioning, and so I would often walk a, a block away to a place called Dixie Lee. Dixie Lee had a little bit of air conditioning. Not a lot, but it was more than none. And so I would get something to eat, and I would sit there. I might study or do something, get a little bit of air conditioning before I went back. So I went up to the counter, and I placed my order, and then uh, I gave them money. In Trinidad and Guyana, it's called cashing. I was cashing. And the exchange rate is 208 to 1. And so if you buy a hamburger, fries, and a Coke, it would be like $1,800. So I give the lady the money. I'm cashing. And now she is counting out the money. It takes a long time. But in addition to that, a next lady comes up, and she looked at me and said, are you a teacher? I said, sure, I'm a teacher. And she said, good. Could you teach me math and science? And I go, no, 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 I'm not that kind of teacher. And I said, why do you need math and science? She says, because I want to be a nurse, and I've got to have math and science before I go back and study to be a nurse. I looked at her, and I said, I think you'd be a good nurse. And she said, how do you know me? She said, could you read me? She thought I was a psychic reader or something. And I said, no, 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 it's not like that. But sometimes God just tells me things. I said, tell me what's going on in your life, and I'll see if God tells me anything. And she said, I'm going to tell you something that no one else knows. You're the only person I've told. Me and the lady who's counting the money really slow. She wants to hear everything. <laughs> she said, I'm living with a guy, and I'm not married, common law. And I already have a child, and I'm pregnant again. And she's, he's telling me to have an abortion. I don't want to have an abortion, but I don't even know how I can function and work, you know, and I just, I, I don't know what to do. And she's in great distress. And in that moment, God told me something to say to her. And I told her what to say. I, I told her, when you go home, this is what you need to do. You need to pray. The first time she's prayed in years, you need to pray, and I want you to pray this. And she said, I will do it. I rushed in the next day to just see if I could find her. And she was totally changed. Everything in her life was identical, but change happened on the inside of her. There was a smile on her face. She prayed for the first time in years, and God heard her prayer. And she felt a peace come over her life. It was a harvest that was right there, but I didn't know it. But God gave me eyes to see that this is a lady not just talking about a teacher, but really there was something in her life that God wanted to do. So there's a harvest you can see. And actually, the last thing we want to say is we need to begin by pre-loving people. My wife, wife tells a story 
she first of all talks a lot about uh, her mother. Uh, my mother-in-law uh, was an alcoholic when Pam accepted Jesus. And in fact, she was an alcoholic who sometimes would be gone for three days at a time. And Pam, as a teenager, would go down um, by where the bars are. She was too young to go in, so she would wait for a door to open to see if her mom was in there. Pam accepted Jesus. Her life changed later on. My mother-in-law responded to Jesus. She became a dynamic Christian. But this image of growing up around alcoholics really had an effect on her. And so she would often then see people who were alcoholics, and it, had, uh, it automatically had an effect on her. She would begin to view them differently because of the experiences she had in her past. Some of you understand that, experiences you have and you view people or situations differently because of those things in the past. But God began to teach her that what really needed to happen was that she needed to love first. And we have a neighbor. The neighbor lives right across the street. Her name is Patsy. And when we first moved into this house where we are, Patsy came over. And as Patsy came over, she was sloppy drunk. She was, she threw her, Pam was sitting in the van, she threw her arms around her, and she was saying, I just love you so much, and she's just going on about this, and I love Jesus too, and she's, and Pam is just, everything inside her is just kind of crawling because it reminds her of the past, and so when the situation is over and she's finally freed from Patsy, um, Patsy in this encounter continues to kind of haunt her. In fact, later that day, as we were preparing for a team to come, she fell, hurt her arm badly, broke her hand, lost a knuckle. As you shake her hand today, she'll show you the missing knuckle. <laughs> and so she began to associate that what happened with the accident was really related to Patsy, something there. And God began to work on her. God began to show her that he loved Pam before she was lovable. And how God loves us before we even respond to him began to show that he loved Patsy. And one thing my wife has done in memory of her mom for several years is she'll buy a Bible because uh, my mother-in-law became just this woman of the word, read through her Bible every year and would get a new Bible, would give herself a Bible. She would write in it from Bonnie to Bonnie, the best gift you could ever give yourself. <laughs> and so Pam began giving Bibles to women in memory of her mom. And I remember the day she said that she believed God wanted her to give a Bible in memory of her mom to Patsy. Because God was teaching her that you have to pre-love people. Pre-love. Instead of allowing all the circumstances to affect us, we begin with love. We choose to love first. And as God was teaching her to choose to love Patsy, we got a Bible. Bibles are expensive in Trinidad. In fact, some of your team bought Bibles and shipped them to Trinidad. Those are already being given out. So we went and bought this Bible. It was a nice Bible, not, not cheap, a nice Bible. We walked over. She began to explain the story to Patsy of her mom and how she now gives out Bibles. Patsy received this, not just a Bible, but she received the fact that Pam had pre-loved her. So now we have this relationship with Patsy kids, grandkids. In fact, one of the granddaughters has now lived with us for six months. We have another, some of the other relatives, we've had great impact. But it began because my wife chose to pre-love someone who wasn't very lovely. It really brings us to where we are. Because it's not just missionaries that touch people that need Jesus. But there's people all over Des Moines that need Jesus. And I wish I could show you through God's eyes 
the people you're shopping with. I wish I could show you through God's eyes the people where you're getting gas, the people who are your neighbors. Because if you would see with God's eyes, suddenly you would see all around you people who God has already been working on and people whose hearts are opening up to God today. And suddenly you would say, I'm not an evangelist, but I can see there's a harvest all around me. And what we really want is we just want us as Christians to see the world the way God sees it. Because when we see it through his eyes, it opens up possibilities that nobody thought was possible. Could you just take a minute and just bow your heads with me? Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for the time we've had to share. And Father, I'm just in awe at what you are doing around the world. You're touching people that in times past we would have thought were, it, there was no way for those people to respond to Jesus. You're changing lives. You're transforming people. But Lord, today the thing that amazes me is the number of times that I miss those you're working on. I don't have eyes to see. And even as we have talked about that this morning, what I want to pray for, Lord, is for this group of people in this room today that they will have your eyes and they will be your hands and they will be your feet as they go through this week. So in the name of Jesus, would you let your heart touch their heart? Would you let your eyes become their eyes? Would you let your compassion be their compassion? I pray they would feel what you feel. May their heart be broken by the things that break your heart. May they be moved by the things that move you. And so we just place them in your hands. I pray for a harvest of souls for the kingdom of God from this group of people. Not from the pastors, but from those who are sitting here in the seats because they have been willing to see what you see and hear what you say to them. And with your eyes closed, yeah, I just, I'm here maybe once a year. I didn't even ask permission. But it's hard for me to talk about this without giving opportunity, because there may be somebody who is in here today, and you don't know for certain that heaven is your home. You don't know for certain that your sins are forgiven. And like some of the people we have talked about, that today is a day that you need to just give your life to Jesus and let him transform you. And with people just praying right now, if that's you, would you just raise a hand? And I just want to pray with you. Is there anyone here in here that would say, today's the day that I need to give my life to Jesus? Father, we just thank you for this church. Thank you for their heart and their passion. Thank you for the reach into the community. And I pray you take it to another level. And it's because of Jesus we pray. Amen.